read the title, you know what you're in for. Today, we're going to be ranking every Cartoon Network villain ever. That means we're looking at 30 shows. Buckle up, people. The rules are simple. If this villain showed up in your town, what could they do? Would they take over a playground, the city, the world? Then we put them in their tier. The rankings go all the way up from S tier. This man is basically Thanos incarnate to F tier. Uh, watch out for your playgrounds, I guess. And also, major spoiler alert for basically every Cartoon Network show ever. Fair warning. Okay, starting off our list, let's look at the very beginning of Cartoon Network history with Dexter's Laboratory. Here we have Mandark, a kid who happens to be an evil scientist. He's the arch enemy of Dexter, a kid who happens to be a mad scientist. No enhanced abilities, no physical mutations, no nothing. Take note, there's a difference between evil and mad. Okay? See, Dexter's a pretty well-mannered genius most of the time, but even saying Mandark's name sometimes causes lightning to crash down from above. Go ahead, Mandark. This location will be quite adequate. That's pretty evil already. To add on to that, Mandark's got a giant lab that he can teleport to, and it supposedly accommodates for every aspect of science known to man. The only question is, with all of this power, what can Mandark do? Well, if you watch the Dexter's Lab movie Ego Trip, you'll see just what this rotten kid is capable of. You've got your run-of-the-mill stuff, you know, having an evil outfit, shooting laser guns, attempted robbery, all that fun junk. But here's the big one. Mandark actually takes over the world in the future, in what kind of looks like a version of Orwell's 1984. He's got a big old futuristic society where everyone is labeled and forced to work, including future Dexter. In fact, Mandark publicly tortures and humiliates future Dexter on TV super frequently, which is super messed up. Later on, he also pretty much sends the world back to the Stone Ages by bombing it into smithereens and outlawing science in its entirety. Looks like a bomb yet. However, it's important to note that him taking over the world and then destroying it was all thanks to him stealing the ideas of Dexter's and using them for evil. He's also got a time machine that he uses to bring a bunch of different versions of himself to fight a bunch of different versions of Dexter. Yeah, the movie's a little complicated. He may also have a crush on Dexter's sister, Dee Dee. Now that's the evilest thing of all. But in all seriousness, yeah, Mandark is probably just gonna get a C tier from me. He's definitely smart and dangerous, but he is just a kid, so, you know, just ground him or something, I don't know. Next up chronologically is Johnny Bravo. And well, there isn't really a villain in Johnny Bravo, unless we consider Johnny himself to be one. See, Johnny doesn't really know boundaries all that well. He kind of creeps on women, like, a lot. I mean, he just straight up kisses this random girl as soon as he sees her, not even asking if it's okay first. Like, I don't know, man. Johnny seems kind of like a bit of a jerk to me. I mean, these girls constantly say no to him, and yet he just... I'll take it from here, sweet cakes. I'd say that's like, sorta a villainous thing to do. More so just inconsiderate. Though, it may just be that he's too dumb to realize that they aren't interested. So, let's put Johnny Bravo in F here. It's kinda a stretch to say he's even a villain, but he is a creep at bare minimum, and that honestly just makes me uncomfortable more so. Now we're looking at Cow and Chicken, and we're looking at the red guy. Yeah, that's his name. Very clearly a devil, but whatever. This guy takes a lot of different identities throughout the series. Fashionista, drill sergeant, supervillain, but there's a few consistencies with him throughout all the show. He's always incompetent, he always gets his comeuppance, and he's always really, really annoying. Come here, sailor eyes. Though, I'll say this, he at least has disguises. D tier. I cannot stand him though, he's so freaking annoying. The Powerpuff Girls have a ton of enemies, but none more infamous than Mojo Jojo. He's a super smart green monkey who wants to destroy the Powerpuff Girls, crush Townsville, and conquer the world. In the Powerpuff Girls movie, we see that Mojo was actually partially the cause of the Powerpuff Girls' creation when he accidentally knocked Professor Utonium into a vat of Chemical X, which, you know, combined with sugar, spice, and everything nice. <laughs> However, the spill also hit Mojo Jojo, who before the accident was a normal lab monkey. In that movie as well, he figures out a way to mass-produce hyper-intelligence monkeys like himself using Chemical X, and then unleashes them on the city, taking it over for a brief period of time. He also decides to inject himself with Chemical X and become kaiju size too, which, yeah, is definitely not something to scoff at power-wise. Ultimately though, he's defeated by the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> and the professor even makes an antidote for Chemical X, meaning at basically any moment's notice, all of JoJo's powers can be wiped away. 
It's basically kryptonite for him. So, yeah, this one is a little tough, I think. He's smart enough to be able to fight the Powerpuff Girls and has taken over a city, but he's got the big fatal flaw. I'm gonna say Mojo belongs in B tier. But while we're here, I do have something I need to clarify. For this list, we're mostly looking at main antagonists of these cartoons, but there will be points where we're gonna look at some super powerful side villains. In this case, while Mojo Jojo isn't placing super high, someone like him will be. Him is a pretty mysterious, devil-esque villain who's frequently the bane of the Powerpuff's existence. And well, let me paint a picture of what all they can do. In the episode Speed Demon, the girls disappear due to time travel for 50 years. And who decides to take advantage of their absence during that time? Him. That's who. Uh, the name is pretty confusing sometimes, I know. Him obliterates Townsville and psychologically tortures the residents for each of those 50 years. And even when the Powerpuff Girls try to stop him, their attacks do nothing. Also, the world turns red. So, him has super strength, mind control or telepathy of some kind, and can alter reality. I'd say that's an easy S tier. Yeah, mark my words, you don't want to freaking mess with him. Next up, we've got Ed, Ed, and Eddie. And well, we've got Kevin as our main big bad of the series here, and he's kinda just a jerk. He's got a red hat that he wears backwards and a bike that he likes to charge at people with, but I mean, other than that, he's, he's just a kid. Though, let's give him credit, he is a sadistic little rat. In the episode Your Ed Here, Kevin figures out Eddie's middle name and proceeds to blackmail him with the info. Huh, Skipper? What'd you call me? Making him do a bunch of ridiculous things just to make sure the info doesn't leak out. Kevin ends up blabbing anyways, though, and the whole world figures out Eddie's middle name is... Skipper. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not too bad. He also beats up the gang a lot throughout the series, but still, he's just a bully. Nothing too major. I think the same can be said for Eddie's brother in the big picture show, too. But maybe we could even give him the edge over Kevin here, considering he's a full-grown adult who's got no problem slamming kids into each other. Yeah, pretty cruel, but not anything that'll threaten a whole neighborhood or something. However, the Kanker sisters, May, Lee, and Marie, have been shown to be able to wreck the cul-de-sac under the right circumstances. For instance, when their ship in a bottle is stolen. So I'd say they've got the edge over both Kevin and Eddie's brother here. So here's my ranking. Kevin and Eddie's brother get F'd here considering at the end of the day they're kinda just bullies. And the Kankers get a solid D tier for at least being able to put a town under alert when they get pissed. Still though, they're little girls. Up next is Cat from Courage the Cowardly Dog. He's a big red cat with a British accent. There's no place to run. And he is certainly not a fan of courage, with him frequently trying to murder the poor dog. He's anthropomorphic and is even capable of tricking humans into doing all sorts of things. Like for instance, sign them up for a resort club that turns its guests into machines and then forces them to destroy each other. The more you think about it, the more messed up it gets. So yeah, this guy is smart, conniving, and murderous, but as you'll see with this list as we go forward, that only gets you so far. Also, he's a cat, just spray him with water. D tier, easy. All right, now we're talking. Samurai Jack has one of the biggest villains in cartoon history with Aku. He's a shape-shifting master of darkness. And his goal is universal domination. Not world, universe. The only way to defeat him is by using a magic sword. Everything else is hopeless. After abducting the Emperor while Jack is a kid, Aku quickly enslaves Japan, and just as Jack is about to take him down with a magic blade, Aku sends him into the future. What trickery is this? Aku! Where, yeah, he managed to gain enough power to take over the world, so Jack's gotta stop him. I won't say too much more, but bottom line is this. Aku is an all-powerful demon who enslaves and takes over worlds, and is also a mass murderer, and can barely even be fully defeated with the sword designed to slay him. S tier. Now we're gonna look at the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy, and you know, the villains aren't as scary as you'd think for a show with a grim reaper in it. With that said, this is Nurgle, the ruler of the underworld. Again, he ain't as bad as he sounds. In his first appearance, he kidnaps Billy and Mandy to try and get them to be his friends. Ooh, friends, friends, friends. Yeah, that's the kind of evil we're working with here. He's got all this power, and yet all he wants to do is make a couple of friends and play. He does at least show a little viciousness when Grimm tries to take Billy and Mandy back by snatching him with his tentacles and shocking him. However, any threat of danger is immediately ended when Mandy saves the day by simply kicking the guy in the shin. 
kind of pathetic if you ask me. However, I'll give Nurgle credit, he does progressively get more evil as time goes on. Take for instance his next episode, where he drags a carnival up to the surface, complete with volcanoes I might add, all in order to, again, just make a friend. Yeesh. But I will say, when that doesn't work, he decides to force people to become his friends by straight up possessing them, which also gives them this freaky form. Honestly, as sad as Nurgle seems to be, that aspect alone bumps him up a few pegs in our ranking. I'd probably place him in C tier, despite how freaking pitiful he is. Up next is Father, from codename Kid Next Door. This guy means a bit of business. He's a mysterious figure who's pretty much always cloaked, and he's got a real hatred for the mischievous members of the kids next door, frequently trying to get them to behave by any means necessary. He's a pretty cunning guy, and at one point even managed is to take control of all Kids Next Door sectors around the world. He then decides to infest each and every one of the treehouse bases with broccoli. Also, they're forced to eat through it. And as we all know, kids don't like broccoli. He's also got the power of pyrokinesis, meaning he controls fire and can burn whatever or whoever he pleases. That one speaks for itself. And if that one wasn't enough for you, he's also shown he knows his way around technology. There's obviously the broccoli device I brought up earlier, but that's nothing compared to what else he has in his repertoire. In the episode Operation Graduates, Father creates a machine that manages to turn any and all Kids Next Door members into animals. What in the heck does this say? Uh, that might not sound too scary at first, but think about it. You'd pretty much lose any and all human recognition if you get turned into an animal. A bit more threatening now, huh? To cap it all off, he's got the power to shapeshift, and his favorite form has gotta be a dragon, cause, you know, it spits fire. And, uh, it spits a lot of fire. I mean, here it's shown to be enough to be visible from space. I mean, there's only one way to take care of that, and it's ice. I guess, ice cream. Which, yeah, has been shown as enough to beat this guy, so really, I'm scratching my head a bit in regards to just how dangerous Father really is. I'm close to giving him S tier, but I'd say being weak to ice cream is a pretty huge flaw, so let's just put Father in A tier and move along. We've got two villains we're gonna talk about for Teen Titans, and they've got a lot up their sleeves to say the least. First up is Slade, who I'd say is probably the main antagonist of the series. He's the archenemy of Robin in particular, and is a master assassin. You and I are so very much alike. Being an assassin, he's extremely quick and a definite expert in combat, but with the right weapons, he can be even more deadly. In the finale of season one, he injects all of the Titans except Robin with microscopic robots that will blow them up with a push of a button, all just to get Robin to be his apprentice. Yeah, it's pretty screwed up. Now, thankfully, the team does end up stopping Slade there, but that's not all he's done. In season two, he tries his hand at getting another apprentice, this time being Terra, a girl with geokinetic abilities. She can control rocks and stuff, that's what that means. Terra was a titan. What did we ever do to make you hate us so much? You were born. Oh no! But after a lot of psychological manipulation by Slade, he managed to turn her completely around and get her to try and kill the Titans. Together, the two manage to take over the entirety of Jump City, where the Teen Titans live, but eventually she's broken out of her little evil laps and blasts Slade into lava. <laughs> Though, all of this does kind of cause her to be frozen in stone. Oh, but don't worry, he's not done yet. Slade comes back from the dead and is on the lookout for Raven, even has a nifty little birthmark on his head. Oh, and he can control fire, electricity, and can float now, too. Can't believe I forgot about that. And he's impervious to Raven's powers. But you can't stop me. He's not overpowered, I swear. So, uh, now you may be asking, okay, how exactly does Slade go from 0 to 100 so quickly? Well, he's made a deal with a devil, and is offered his own flesh and blood back in return for helping ending the world. I expect you to keep your part of the bargain and return what is precious to me. Of course, the demon doesn't hold up his end of the bargain. Why would you expect that? Slade does eventually get reincarnated, though, by just straight up murdering a devil. So in the end, he's evil as hell. You get it? Demons. <laughs> okay. And speaking of demons, we're also now gonna look at the jolly old fella Slade made a deal with in the first place, Trigon. He's also Raven's dad. Go figure. 
Trigon is a giant, evil, interdimensional hellspawn that desires nothing more than to conquer everything and end the reign of mortals. He created Raven as a portal to eventually get to Earth, destroyed her real homeworld where her mother lived, and then the second he made it to Earth, he set it ablaze and turned everyone to stone. He has an army of fire demons, can shoot lasers, used the Teen Titans home as a literal throne, is all-knowing, can create evil clones of anyone, and even tried to just straight up kill his own daughter when she had no more use to him. And he can just tear a hole into another dimension with his finger. Yup. Super easy. He's only beaten because he underestimated the daughter that he imbued his own powers into. Trigon is S-tier. Slade, on the other hand, I'll have to put in B tier. He's got a whole lot to him, but most of what he did in the show came down to him using other people's powers to his advantage. We've got another DC show to look at here, with Justice League Unlimited. But thankfully, this is going to be a bit easier to cover. For this series, we have this amalgamation of both Lex Luthor and Brainiac. To put it in simple terms, by the end of the second season, Lex Luthor had figured out a way to transfer his body into an invincible android. But, as it was destroyed, Your brain. Cow. Brainiac revealed himself to be inhabiting Luthor's body, and well, then this happened. Into the android. But you Brainiac influenced Luthor to build the android, but once it was destroyed, he had to work with what he had. Nothing too dangerous, you know. Just a body that can withstand point-blank gun blast, regenerate itself, grow massive tendrils that are strong enough to hold the entire Justice League at bay, can digitize entire people out of existence, and can create and merge with any technology available to cause all kinds of citywide destruction, including technology that can convert any raw matter into whatever they choose. Yeah, these two are busted. Brainiac's main goal is just to absorb and then delete all information, but when he emerges with Luthor, he realizes that with an all-knowing mind, he's a god, and with their new powers, they can remake the universe into whatever they please. The only way these two are defeated is thanks to the flash bending time by going at supersonic speeds. And right after he does so, he vanishes out of existence. I think that's yet another easy S tier. After all that universe-threatening stuff, let's relax a bit with Foster's home for imaginary friends and its main antagonist, Max's older brother, Terrence. He's a troubled teen who is a bully to his little sibling and wants to get rid of Blue, Max's imaginary friend. Now, Terrence is a jerk, make no mistake about it. He's clearly not nice to his little brother at all, with him locking Mac in a closet and attempting to kill Blue even from the very first episode. Terrence, alongside Duchess, another villain from the show, try to feed Blue to the Extremosaurus, which is exactly what it sounds like. <laughs> giant mechanical dinosaur thing. Pretty scary and all, but Terrence has two major problems here. For starters, Mac himself says he's confused in regards to how Terrence could even come up with a plan to kill Blue, cause, well... Problem is, Terrence is stupid. Not just stupid stupid, but really stupid. He's too stupid. And as well as that, murder is bad and all, but he's trying to murder an imaginary friend. And that's just it. They're imaginary. So in all honesty, it's not really murder. At bare minimum, this guy is just a mean older brother. At the end of the day, Terrence is just a bully. And for me, that means he's getting a spot in F tier. Alright, this one's gonna get weird. We've got Scoutmaster Lumpus from Camp Laszlo. As the head of Camp Kidney, Lumpus, or Lumpus as he prefers to be called, is in charge of each and every one of the scouts. And, well, can you guess what he does with that power? Of course, he abuses it. He is on this list, after all. He's prone to outbursts of violence, particularly towards his assistant, Slinkman, and also is super irresponsible with his scouts, at one point even tricking them to dig a giant hole so he can make a bowling alley. And of course, he leaves the kids unattended with the tools. Now, this doesn't seem too bad until you realize that this guy isn't even the real Scoutmaster. Yeah, at the end of the show, it's revealed that he shoved the real Scoutmaster in a closet for the whole summer, and the police show up and take him back to the mental asylum for where he broke free from. So yeah, in reality, Scoutmaster Lumpus is an escaped psycho. We have no idea what crimes he's committed other than kidnapping, and he was left unattended with children for an entire summer. He didn't do anything super evil during the show, but for the mysteriousness of his past alone, he's gonna be in D tier for me.
All right, we're moving from Crazy Scoutmaster to Intergalactic Warlord. We're looking at Ben 10 and we're looking at Vilgax. Vilgax is probably Ben's most fearsome enemy and will stop at nothing to tear the Omnitrix from his wrist so he can use it for his own personal tool of war. He's got an army of robots, super strength, is nearly immortal by being able to enhance himself every time he's super injured, and can even escape from the Null Void, which is basically a supervillain prison in the show. It's not easy to do, trust me. And basically every time Ben beats him, usually by tossing him into the vastness of space, he always comes back, again and again. And for a reminder, he always comes back with enhancements to both himself and his army. And he can become a giant squid. So yeah, considering this guy has a robot army and everything else I just said, I think it's fair to place him in S tier. Okay, here's a tricky one actually. Endive from Chowder. Endive's main goal is just to be a better chef than Mung Dahl. She and her apprentice Panini will constantly try and get in the way of and one-up Mung and Chowder. And you know, on surface level, it doesn't seem too bad. However, when we start to talk about her size, that is where things get complicated. She's got a bit of cartoon magic to her. You'll see what I mean. In most shots, she just looks like a run-of-the-mill average big orange woman. She's easily the biggest character in the show, even then, but sometimes she's just inexplicably bigger than that. Sometimes even in shots that are right next to each other, she'll go from being normal size to maybe two or three times as big. Obviously, this is just done for comedic effect, but I mean, at certain points, you've got to question if this is just something she can do. I mean, take this scene here. Look at how small Chowder is at the start of the shot, and then look at the end. At certain points, she looked like she could stomp on the guy. What makes this even more confusing is the size of her toilet. I'm not kidding. The size of Chowder and his friend Gaspacho in comparison to the thing is insane! This literally looks like something out of Jack and the Beanstalk. Honestly, I think for her potential size alone, she's at least in D tier, but I mean, other than that, she's just got a snarky attitude. However, we can never ever forget the most evil thing she's ever done by far! Eat her toe jam with a fork! I mean, come on, Endive, everyone knows you gotta use a spoon. All right, folks, put your sea legs on. It's time to look at the marvelous misadventures of Flapjack. And here's the thing about this show. It doesn't have a clear-cut villain. However, I'll say the guy who consistently causes the most problems for the group of Flapjack, Bubby, and Knuckles is, well, Captain Knuckles. I mean, in one of the very first episodes of the show, Knuckles bets Flapjack on a poker game. Yeah, he just puts the little boy's life potentially in the hands of these Rusty looking sailors. You're willing to stake a kid that amazing on this one game of cards? Yep. Or how about the time he encourages Flapjack to make enemies to become a greater adventure, which almost gets Flapjack beaten up. Your mom is so ugly that she has a green bottle for a face. Luckily, Knuckles is deemed more of a jerk than Flap, so he takes the beating. Or how about the time he finds a pair of giant scary legs and terrorizes the entire seaport with them? I mean, he literally takes candy from a baby with them. Dude, that's just low. And that's not even getting into all the danger Knuckles is putting Flapjack in just by bringing him along on his adventures. Plus, he's just not a very responsible caretaker in the first place. Overall, Captain Knuckles is just a bad influence more than a truly bad guy. I'm gonna put him in F tier. Kinda another Johnny Bravo scenario. For for the Garfield show, we have Normal, the small gray cat. This is my chance to get even with Garfield at last! Normal, he's annoying, no other information needed, F tier. Next! It's adventure time, uh, time, ladies and gents, and I think you can guess who the main villains are here. I'll start with the easy one first, Ice King. Ice King is a blue wizard with a magic crown that allows him to control ice, and he's initially the main antagonist for Finn and Jake. His main goal is to kidnap princesses so he can marry one, with Princess Bubblegum being at the top of his list. Now, being a wizard who can control ice, you may have guessed that he can freeze people, and yeah, you'd be absolutely correct. Oh no! But he can also conjure up snow monsters, fly using his beard, and has an army of penguins at his disposal at all times. 
all of whom are named Gunter. Now, with all of that, you may think Ice King is just your run-of-the-mill bad guy, but actually, his character is a lot deeper than just a crazy old wizard. You see, he actually used to be a normal guy named Simon Petrikov before the Great Mushroom War. But once he put on the magic crown, he slowly began to lose his mind. His wife left him due to his breakdown, who he always referred to as his princess. And then maybe Betty, my princess, maybe you will love me again. And... Well, you can probably connect the dots. After this secret of his comes out, he actually becomes a bit more friendly with Finn, Jake, and the rest of the citizens of the movie, and more well-behaved. In fact, before he lost his mind completely, he actually helped a little girl traverse a nuclear wasteland, showing that at heart, Rice King really isn't that bad of a guy. Now, the Lich, on the other hand, I can't really say the same. He's an immortal being of pure evil who wants nothing more than the end of all life. He can control the minds of anyone who's unlucky enough to cross his path unprotected. Literally leaves a trail of death wherever he goes. Is unbelievably powerful when he has his magic being able to use green fireballs and such. And can resurrect himself through possession. <laughs> As pyrokinesis, can grow up to an ungodly size even when possessing another host, can possess dead bodies and impersonate them perfectly, and when given the chance, uses a wish from Prismo to eliminate all life in existence. Yeah, he wished for the extinction of all life and I did it. Guess it changed his timeline or something. What? And worst of all, he'll try to do this no matter what, in every multiversal dimension possible. Yep, even in the timeline where Finn wishes the Lich had never existed, guess what? He shows up through Jake. Yeah, move out of the way, Thanos. It's the Lich who's really inevitable. The Lich is gonna be another S-tier villain. And Ice King is gonna go into D-tier for being a guy with a lot of power, but a nice heart. Even if he was pure evil, just find a way to knock his crown off, and you're all good. Regular show has a lot of great villains, shout out to Garrett Bobby Ferguson, but none are more threatening than Anti-Pops. So Pops, the friendliest character you could imagine, has an evil twin brother, and yeah, he's not so nice. This is why I want to end the stupid universe! Over a space deer. In fact, he's so not nice that he wants his own brother dead. That's pretty not nice. Where Pops is the embodiment of pure good, Anti-Pops is the embodiment of pure evil, and the two cosmic deities are destined to be at war with one another. If Pops doesn't hold him off, it could supposedly mean the end of the entire universe. Who'd have thought so much lore could come from the naive man from Lollyland? In one of his earliest appearances, we can see that he can float, melt stuff with his mind, has an army of Boba Fett looking dudes, can wipe people out of existence, and worst of all, has a gunship that can destroy entire planets. Yeah, that's scary. In the last episode, it's revealed that Pops and Anti-Pops' battles always end in a draw that destroys and then resets the universe, causing the same thing to happen over and over again. In fact, that even happens in the final episode after the two reach their final forms. After their final punch, the show resets back to the first episode of the series. Luckily, Rigby and Mordecai figure out something is up and go forward in time to help Pops. But even by then, Anti-Pops' power is unraveling the reality of the show itself, with things starting to revert to storyboards. In fact, the only thing that's able to take out Anti-Pops is a cosmic-powered hug from Pops directly into a star that kills them both. That's a hell of a way to go out. Anti-Pops gets it- S tier for all his cosmic chaos and his inevitability. Another Thanos tier character, I swear. For the amazing world of Gumball, we have Rob. Or Dr. Rector, I guess, if you want to go with this super villain name. He's a kid from Elmore Junior High who is just rich. <laughs> So forgettable. Even Gumball and Darwin don't recognize him when they meet in public, and after they kick him into a sewer so they can get on with their day, they forget about him again. He's so forgettable that he actually was banished to a void where mistakes are sent, and was horribly disfigured when he made his escape. Gumball and Darwin help him find a purpose in the world, that being becoming their mortal enemy and taking away everything they love. Though he's not really good at it. 
Yeah, the first time Rob tries to hurt Gumball and Darwin, he actually ends up needing their help. His own arch enemies help him pick out his villain name, costume, and even his laugh. That's kind of sad in the world of super villainy. The most evil thing he does is probably get his hands on a universal remote that can affect reality, and then use it to try and destroy Gumball's life. Though admittedly, he does so in much more messed up ways than you'd think. Like here, Rob uses the remote to erase a guy from existence. What an anti-pops poser. And after ruining his family life, he locks Gumball into the void he was trapped in. Though eventually he does come around on Gumball for trying to save his life, and resets everything that happened in the episode before destroying the remote. So there goes that power. In a later episode, after he turns back to the dark side, Rob kidnaps Banana Joe's mom to get her to tell him his future. Uh, don't ask. But without that remote, he's defeated pretty swiftly, with him only able to rely on Banana Joe's mom's painting to add things to reality. It's a neat power, but it's not his. And again, yeah, he's beaten in a pretty hardcore fashion. Overall, Rob does have some access to some pretty strong powers, but they aren't his, and oftentimes it's still not enough to even beat Gumball. I'll give him D tier. He could at least do some damage, I think. Yeah, how many of you forgot about this? I always a certain... appeal? <laughs> or wanted to forget about this. Annoying Orange had a TV show, and its villain was this piece of space broccoli, the Broccoli Overlord. So this guy is an alien piece of broccoli that wants to destroy all fruit on Earth and has a bunch of ideas on how to do so, all of which are ridiculous. Like the time he turned all of the discarded veggies in the world into fruit-eating zombies, only for Orange to defeat them by... <laughs> Laughing. Yeah. In another episode, he puts a laser in Nerville's head that will pop out and destroy all fruit. Also, uh, Nerville is the grocery store clerk. Also, what the hell is happening? He's got a giant spaceship with lasers, a bunch of broccoli soldiers. You know what? I'm gonna stop. He's a piece of broccoli, for God's sake, and he has nothing against humans, only fruit. F tier. He's smaller than your foot. Literally just stop. Now we're looking at Uncle Grandpa, and in particular, we're going to be taking a look at Aunt Grandma, because of course that's the villain to the series. Where Uncle Grandpa is everyone in the world's uncle and grandpa, and helps everyone out by taking them out on wacky adventures, Aunt Grandma is everyone's aunt and grandma, and helps people out with real and down-to-earth solutions. She always shows Uncle Grandpa up, and is kind of a massive jerk about it, but why is she so mean to Uncle G, you may ask? Well, he accidentally cost her first place in a science fair when she was a kid, and now she's mad at him. Really mad, actually, and even beats the crap out of him and takes his mustache, and then flies off like Mary Poppins. Well, she's got that going for her. After that outburst, she comes back and convinces all of Uncle Grandpa's friends to ditch him through some hardcore lies and manipulation, and hops right back to trying to show up the guy in every way. Eventually, though, she admits she hopes the company will become big enough to rule the world, and starts creating her own problems to solve. She does build her company up quite a bit through these tactics, and is able to make robots of herself to fight the gang, but they're honestly horrible at fighting and are all destroyed. I mean, how do you lose a fight to a pizza? It's a slice. Really, Aunt Grandma is just kinda a jerk who can fly, but the robot thing does give her a bit of an edge, so let's put her in D tier. For Steven Universe, we gotta look at White Diamond, the ruler of Gym World. She's a giant white gem who's in charge of their whole dystopia, and only cares for the further gem colonization of planets, including Earth. She plans on using the Cluster, a big clump of dead gem souls, to do so, and, well, if the Cluster awakens, it destroys all of Earth, of course. This desire to colonize Earth led to the gem war between the Crystal Gems and Homeworld Gems, and when the Crystal Gems were winning, White Diamond decided to blast a corrupting light across all of the planet, corrupting the remaining gems into deformed monsters, whether they were on her side or not. But once the other diamonds start to sympathize with the Crystal Gems' cause, they're drained of all color and personality by White, and then bubbled away. Yeesh, that's evil. She does the same with Steven Friends, too, and turns them into puppets to express White Diamond's perfect attributes. One thing to note though, it seems she can't control humans, only gems. So I mean, if she wanted to take over the world, she's basically only able to send people to do the job for her, because she hates leaving Gem World. I think that's gonna make White Diamond an A tier for me. Dangerous for sure, but more so for gems than humans when she's by herself. It's time for- Clarence, which also means it's time to look at old Belson Knowles. Belson is a kid that goes to school alongside Clarence at Aberdale Elementary, and is a bully to Clarence. 
though I don't think Clarence realizes that. He's really kind of just grumpy towards Clarence, being dismissive of most of the things he says. He's got a group of, like, half-bully friends who like to hang out with him, and usually help him do normal bully things like throw pine cones. Not much more to say, honestly. He's a kid who's a jerk. Nothing more. F tier. Next up is the Beast from Over the Garden Wall. The Beast is a tree spirit mentioned by the woodsman in the first episode of the miniseries, who chops down the Edelwood trees of the forest to keep his lantern lit. Keep that in mind. We learn that the Beast leads people who are lost in the woods towards him, and turns people, particularly children, into Edelwood trees, and then keeps their souls in a dark lantern. But actually, turns out the Beast caught the woodsman's daughter and put her soul in the lantern, and now the woodsman is just infinitely gathering wood to make sure her flame doesn't die out. That's heavy. Eventually, Greg, one of the main characters, is caught and ensnared in the branches of a tree by the Beast, and nearly becomes a part of the woods. The Beast offers to put Greg's soul in the lantern so his brother Wirt can fuel it for the rest of his life like the woodsman. But Wirt figures that the only soul in the lantern is the Beast himself, and then frees his brother. Just like that. Problem solved, I guess. The woodsman lets go of his daughter that was never there, and blows the lantern out, and the Beast is slain. Also, he looks like this. Have fun sleeping tonight knowing he's made of the lost souls of dead children. But with all that said, being able to be killed via blowing <laughs> kind of blows. <laughs> Alright, putting him in C tier and moving on. <sighs> I love Wee Bear Bears. Now that that's out of the way, let's talk about Agent Trout, the main antagonist of the Wee Bear Bears movie. After the town gets mad at the bears for just having to deal with too much of their shenanigans, and then also having to deal with being forced to watch the bears do the Fortnite default dance, ugh, they want something done about the bears. Agent Trout arrives on the scene and pledges to restore the natural order by locking the bears away in a nature cage and cutting them off from society. Later, he's also shown to have a special task force to help track down the bears, catches the bears and locks them up, and plans to separate the bros, sending Ice Bear to the Arctic, Panda to China, and keeping Grizz in a prison in the States with a bunch of other abused grizzlies. Apparently, Trout wants to keep humans as the natural top predators of the world, and this is the best he can do without outright hunting them down. So he also seems to have no issues in using a taser to hurt all the captives he has, but ultimately is locked into a cage by sheer intimidation. I'd say this guy is D-tier. Honestly, only because of his task force and likely government position. Next up, we have OKKO. OK and for this, we're gonna be looking at a team, Professor Venomous and Lord Boxman. Venomous is a villain in a world full of heroes, and also works side by side along Lord Boxman, another villain who's a big fan of all things robotic. Venomous is a bioengineer himself, but as a client of Boxman's, he absolutely has no shortage of available technology to destroy heroes with, weapons, robots, or otherwise. The two's powers combine when Boxman's technology and Venomous's bioengineering merge to make Boxman Jr. an evil baby who wants to destroy the plaza and all heroes within it and does a heck of a good job in trying to do so, even taking out Mr. Gar, who's a force to be reckoned with himself. Later on, while Boxman is gone, Venomous just casually uses a doomsday weapon to make the government give him a bunch of money, and then just goes about his day, even saying the whole thing bored him. So, that's scary. Later on, it's revealed that Laser Blast, an old hero of the plaza who went MIA, is actually KO's father. Oh, and it's important to note that the guy was always bored of his powers and wanted more. Well, yeah, if you couldn't piece the boredom tendencies together, Venomous is Laser Blast after he lost all his powers. And yeah, that also means he's KO's father. Back when he was still Laser Blast, he studied bioengineering to see what he could do to become more powerful, but instead developed a weapon that could remove the powers of others. He had to cover his tracks though, and while doing so, accidentally blew one up, and he lost his powers himself. Now he sells bioweapons to villains to gain financial power, in place of the superpowers he no longer has. So add Terrible Father to the list of bad things about this dude. 
In the finale of the series, Venomous merges with a character named Shadowy Figure to become Shadowy Venomous and teams up with TKO, KO's repressed evil side. Shadowy Venomous starts a tournament to try and become the strongest character in the universe once more by having TKO compete and use his abilities to drain every hero in the world's power, which is evil enough to even get Lord Boxman to try and stop it. Eventually, though, TKO and Shadowy Venomous's deal falls through, and Venomous is defeated. So is TKO, though, don't worry. Overall, Venomous and Boxman are kind of mid-tier villains. For the longest time, neither of them had powers, and when one does get them, they just want to drain everyone else of theirs. But where exactly would they go from there? I'm gonna say these guys belong in B tier. Next is Apple and Onion, and well, we have Chicken Nugget. He's a short, tempered chicken nugget who is also a policeman, and he's not very good at his job. Everyone knows I'm the boss. Ah! Ah! He typically just tries to ruin all of Apple and Onion's fun, but other than that, yeah, this dude is just a chicken nugget. I'm not going through this song and dance again like I did with Annoying Orange. Eat him, F tier. Next, we have Craig of the Creek, with King Xavier being who we're looking at. He's the ruler of the corrupt other side of the creek, and wants to be king of the whole creek through any means. If you ever disrespect me like that again, I'll drop you into the maze. Make no mistake, this kid isn't nice, but at the end of the day, I'm gonna save us a lot of time and just say this. He's a kid. I'd say the worst thing he does is send kids to disobey him into a maze that has bad cell service, so... I mean, I guess on the off chance someone can't find their way out, they might starve or something. Eh, that may be a bit drastic, actually, I don't know. I'm putting him in F tier. Sorry to any of you Xavier stands out there. To end off the video, you may have noticed I left a very important show off. That's right, Total Drama Island. If you know this show, I think you know that the villain of this series is none other than Chris McLean. Chris is the host of most seasons of Total Drama Island, and is in charge of setting up challenges for each of the show's contestants to go through. And well, the challenges get worse, and worse, and worse over time. I mean, the very first challenge has the teenage contestants jump off a 1,000 foot cliff into shark infested waters. Or how about the time he set up a wheel of pain to torture all of the contestants until they said uncle? Uncle. I mean, the entire fourth season of the show has the contestants sent back to the original island, which is now completely covered with toxic waste and full of radiated monsters. I want one! Literally, this dude blows up the boat all of the teens were arriving to the island on. Also, he hands the loser of each episode toxic marshmallows, and yeah, those aren't good for you to even touch. And then he launches them via catapult. Worst thing I can remember from when I was a kid was when he sent all of the contestants into an irradiated mine where all the contestants only had a few minutes to live. They had to grab a trophy, escape from mutant mole rats, and then when all was said and done, they cleaned the radiation using... That's not how that works. There are so many other things Chris has done, but if you can't tell, he has no issues with inadvertently killing teens for the sake of entertainment, and he obviously has the tools to do so. C-tier. This guy is scarier than you think. And that is this whole list. What did you think? Anyone I forget that's worth mentioning? Any placement you disagree with? Sound off in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you all think. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!